Okay, so I want to talk about uh, high fidelity nano FDIR, uh, which is the paper where we divide two harmonics by each other or subtract the phases. Um, and you can get from uh, data that looks like this to data that looks like that, where you can, you can really put a ruler and uh, if you take a line profile, it's, it's super flat, surprisingly flat. Um, and the title, uh, unfortunately, is a bit cryptic. Um, really, what we want to, wanted to name this is indirect illumination of an AFM tip. And um, to illustrate this, uh, oh, this is the overview. So what, what happens, what can happen due to indirect illumination, even if you have a sample here like gold, which is uh, completely flat in topography, uh, it doesn't mean that the optical amplitude, amplitude signal is flat, although you would expect it. Um, but we can get it, make it flat using this ratio, and I will explain why, why this is needed, why this is possible. Yeah. Um, before going into the details, um, I would like to recommend you uh, today, after the long day, um, you can go to, the, to this part of the town. There's a smaller beach. Um, you can sit there, watch the sunset, and think about everything that, that you've learned. Um, but you have to be careful, even though today it's a bit cloudy, um, that you are exposed all the time by, by the sun. Um, but not only directly, but also indirectly, because the water, the water is reflecting uh, the sunlight also onto your face. So you have direct sun exposure and indirect sun exposure. If you sum them up, you get sunburn. <laughs> not today, today is okay. <laughs> Um, and uh, the same works if you use an AFM tip. Now you have uh, direct illumination and you have indirect illumination, which is now a reflection at the sample surface. And if you sum them, those two up, you get signal enhancement. That's great. Um, so if you're struggling with signal to noise, um, consider using a highly reflective sample. Um, yeah, so this is indirect illumination. Uh, so we have uh, in this expression for the scattered field, uh, we have this uh, alpha effective, that's the near field interaction, that's taking place uh, via this beta, this is a near field reflection coefficient. Uh, and the far fields, they take place via far field reflection. And these two are in general not the same. So that's, that's very important to realize. If you want to do modeling, you need two different expressions for these. Um, yeah, so uh, Vladimir uh, was questioning if, if this is a fact that we can measure. So we've made here an, an experiment. Uh, we're measuring at these dots. It's measured on silicon and normalized to silicon. So we would expect a signal of one. Um, but we illuminate the tip via bo uh, bornitride flake. And bornitride, it has a, a phonon, around 1400 wave numbers, uh, which means there's a small range where bornitride is very reflective. And this is what we can see here now. Uh, we see an increase in nano FD amplitude because bornitride now reflects additional light onto the tip. Um, so this works. Uh, you can see you see the dashed line. Um, we can also describe this with a far field reflection factor. It fits very nicely. Um, and the surprising thing is we can even see this at a distance of 10 micrometer. This is a question that Fritz was asking. How, how far can you see this effect? 10 micrometer. Uh, this is measured in the infrared. So I would say on the scale of the wavelength, however large your focused spot is. Um, so in this case, yeah, we see it. It's not what you want at all. Uh, one way to, first of all, avoid this problem and to also show that it's an illumination effect is just rotate the sample so that we illuminate from the other side. And now we can see uh, this peak that was here before, it's gone. And this is uh, clear because there's no, no HPN here. Um, yeah, so this is a quick, uh, quick test also for your experiments. If you, have the, if you think it's possible there's an illumination effect, just rotate the sample by 90 degrees, 180 degrees. Does anything change? If yes, then probably it's a, it's a far field effect. Uh, I have a, uh, yeah? a question. Yes? <coughs> In this specific case, uh, you think it's reflection from HBN, or it's uh, you know, it maybe scattering something 
toward the substrate. Kind of, I mean, it's just silicon, there's uh, mm -hmm. something. It may be scattering, I, uh, I comment on this on the next slide. Um, here it's, uh, because this far field refraction factor, it fits so nicely, I think it's reflection and not scattering. Yeah, so I, uh, it's true, I don't know. I, I don't know with 100% certainty what it is because the goal was to get rid of it and not, not fully uh, understand it. Um, yeah, and then, uh, so this is uh, the case. So here I, um, I want to show when is this far field uh, indirect illumination relevant and when is it not. Uh, we've seen this before in, 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 a, in a talk. Um, if we plot the normalized uh, near field response, we have here the yeah, that, uh, effective polarizability, which is normalized, and also the far field. And if these two terms, sample and uh, reference, if they are the same, this just cancels out. And this is happen happens, for example, when we are measuring, like done in this experiment. Yeah, so we are measuring here via silicon. We normalize to silicon. This far field factor is here, but it cancels out. That, that's the case that's illustrated here. Um, the same happens. Uh, if we have a particle, yeah, it's essentially the same case. Uh, here it doesn't matter how we move the sample, the indirect illumination will not contribute. If it's very thin, it will, it's too small to notice. Um, but in some cases, uh, like if you measure at the inside of a thick flake or in a very unknown environment, then you have to account for these effects. And here uh, I show now an example, it's one from the over introduction slide. Uh, it's just the gold on calcium fluoride. You would expect a really flat signal. We observe this. Uh, and for example, at position two, we have now uh, a very strong near field interaction. Here, this beta is one. Very strong far field contribution is also one. It's a very strong signal. Um, at the edge, we have uh, the near field is the same because we're still on the gold. But the far field is now on the calcium fluoride, which does not reflect. Um, so it's small, and that's why here uh, it's a smaller signal. Now the question is, why is it higher here? Uh, and this, we suspect, it could be caused by a scattering at the edge of this gold, which then also illuminates the tip. And actually this is all interfering, so it's getting very complicated very easily. Uh, fortunately, we can already see these two images, they look the same. Um, which is uh, because the, the far field contribution is the same. So if we just divide the two, very nicely, this all goes away. Uh, and this is exactly what's shown in the experiment. You just divide these two images, and you come to this result. Um, yeah, so it works beautifully in images. Uh, in spectra, this is the same data as before. Um, we can also plot the ratio of different uh, harmonics, and this peak disappears. And also, uh, yeah, I, I'm not fully sure what these small things are, but they also disappear. Um, so this works. And now the key question is, uh, what happens with a near-field signal? Does it also disappear or not? Um, and for this, uh, we had one slide, which I think wasn't shown yet, no? Okay, so uh, this is um, SNOM amplitude and SNOM phase plotted for different demodulation orders. And if you look closely here, it's easier to see, um, the higher harmonics, they have a higher contrast. So if you subtract the, the green from the blue curve, uh, there's something left. You don't remove all the signal. Um, you have a much smaller uh, contrast afterwards if you do this. Um, but there's something left. Um, and this is a real near-field signal that's left. Um, and this we've shown here now experimentally. I think it's the last slide with new data. Um, essentially, it's the same experiment as before. We measure next to a bore nitride flake, illuminate via this flake, in order to have here at uh, 1400, this is a far-field peak. We know this uh, by design. Um, and then, we put next to it uh, a single virus, which has two absorption peaks here uh, and here. Uh, so two of these peaks are real, and one of them is, uh, well, two of these peaks are near-field peaks, and one of them is a far-field peak. Uh, 
And we, as control experiment, we rotate the sample. The far field peak disappears, near field peak stays. Uh, and then we plotted just uh, the ratio of these two, uh, of, of two different spectra. And we can see, first of all, the, the peak here from bornitride is gone, successfully suppressed. And what's uh, really nice is that the uh, spectral shape, and uh, it's the same as, uh, as we would expect. So if you compare uh, this phase spectrum here, it has two strong peaks. With the real control experiment, it's two peaks, M1, M2. Uh, we get qualitatively the same, which means we can interpret it analogously. And this is because there are weak oscillators, and uh, it's easier. Um, yes, but we also see, uh, if you look at the scale, uh, if before we had a signal of on the order of six degrees, now it's on the order of two degrees. So we, this is what we lose when we do this. We, we need a much better signal to noise um, when doing this. Okay, so this is the, the ratio. Um, here it was shown uh, that you, with this, using this, calculating this ratio, you can remove far field contributions. Can be illumination, can be scattering, can be maybe other things. Um, but there's more things you can, you can do with this ratio. Um, for example, uh, Fritz was already talking about um, normalizing one reference to another one instead of a reference material. So you can do that too. Um, I would still recommend to also use a reference material. It, um, yeah. um, you can learn about depth of, a, of an object or thickness of an object. We haven't really talked about this yet, um, but Different demodulation orders, they probe differently deep. So if you compare two different probing volumes, you can somehow learn about what's happening in the, in the vertical direction of the sample. Um, if you take this ratio, also the drift will disappear. Uh, I don't have a data it's showing that. So any fluctuation in the interferometer is, is also gone um, because it's the same for all demodulation orders. Um, if it happens that your laser uh, turns off during the measurement, it's losing power slowly. Um, this happened here, for example, the amplitude is just drops, dropping down to zero. Um, this can sometimes happen, especially in long experiments. Um, normally, I, I, I would measure again, this is not always possible, um, but you can try using this ratio to recover some of this information. Uh, and if you look at the substrate or even the contrast here, it's, it's not affected at all. Because this is, a, essentially this is like a illumination effect, you have more or less power. Um, and then one last application, which was used in the first uh, version of the cryos norm, uh, a, a, a variant of this ratio, um, is that mechanical vibrations in the system, they maybe knock the tip a bit further away from the sample, which now also leads to smaller near field signal. Uh, and uh, such a normalization to different harmonics somehow helped reducing this a little bit. I don't know how, how much. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so in summary, um, if you go to, to the beach uh, to watch the sunset, uh, bring sunscreen. Um, uh, I hope you know now uh, SNOM and NFTR, they are sensitive to far field and near field. You always measure both at the same time, but it doesn't always matter. Uh, so in, in, in some cases, they just cancel out anyway. Uh, in more complica complex cases, you can cancel them out via this ratio or if you look at the phase, via this phase difference. Um, the great thing is all this data is measured simultaneously. And even this works on very old data. Maybe in the past you had some data which you couldn't make quite sense out of. Maybe it's worth to just load them in Gridion, divide them, and see what happens. Um, yeah, so it's surprisingly powerful. Uh, for being so simple, it's quite powerful uh, to just plot. Yeah, and then I have uh, uh, one last slide. Uh, where I just uh, plot here different demodulation orders, amplitude and phase. Uh, you've seen the, the spectra before, but maybe by looking at these peak, peaks, uh, are you able already to tell which one is real and which one is not real? Which one is near field and which one is a, is a far field? Um, of course, you know that these small two peaks, uh, they are the near field signals, but the way that you can identify is um, that the peak height it changes uh, with the demodulation order. Um, but this far field peak, it's exactly the same for all demodulation orders. 
Uh, like this, you can, you can identify already, and this is why you can remove it also. Yeah, and with this, uh, now I'm really at the end. <laughs> Maybe I start with the question. Uh, since it's an illumination effect, do you, uh, you know, check systematically how that depends on the average distance from the sample? Because that will moderate the near field, but eventually affect... Which, which distance? <coughs> the, when you do the ratio, right? Mm -hmm. Since the effect that you are canceling is due to the any illumination, it is far field, right? Uh, did you check systematically uh, how that depends on the distance from the sample? Because yeah. the, the near field is affected. Right? You said in cryo happens by chance, kind of. But oh, you mean uh, vertical? Yeah, the, no, the, this, the actual distance, because that is all, one is all far field, the other is a near field, right? Uh, the, the only so it may have some depend specific dependence on the tip sample distance? No, on the tip sample distance, we haven't really studied. I would expect it's the same, uh, because the, the tip sample distance, you vary on the scale of, of the tapping amplitude, let's say 100 nanometer maximum. And this is a far field effect. Uh, it's on the scale of the, of the wavelengths. So over this 100 nanometer tapping, it's constant, more or less. So they're, they're, I wouldn't expect a strong change. Okay. Does it matter uh, which harmonics are used for the normalization? Do, do you have recommendations uh, which, which best to use, which to avoid? Yeah, I, I recommend uh, dividing a higher one by a lower one, because then the, the peaks are still peaks and not dips. Um, and then I always would recommend as high demodulation orders as possible, where the signal to noise is good enough. Because if you start using the lower uh, demodulation orders, there's maybe some background contamination. No. Thank you. you can even, so uh, I always uh, divide it third by second or fourth by third, but you can also skip one of the harmonics. You can divide uh, fourth by second or something like this, so, or, or even any combination of, of harmonics. Um, yeah, you said we can use the higher harmonics okay. for the normalization, um, but you said also that you recommend to use a reference sample, so what might be the problem? Uh, so what, what Fritz showed, uh, he had a spectrum uh, very broad, and then there were uh, water lines, many small peaks, and uh, two sharp lines, and by normalizing to, to a different harmonic, these water lines disappeared, because it's uh, just uh, in the atmosphere, these two peaks, they were from uh, tip contamination, so it was really material there, it was probed, it's a near field effect. Um, if you normalize also to a silicon substrate, then these two, they also disappear. Not perfectly, but uh, yeah, it depends then what's, what's the substrate, what's the sample. Thank you, Lars, again. Um, when, do you, when doing spectra, the goal is naturally to identify the material that we have under analysis, which means we go mostly into resonance or whether weak or strong doesn't really matter. But what matters actually is that at resonance, the penetration, or let's say the volume fraction, since your wave is not really penetrating that much, it's absorbed really because it's absorption, yeah? doesn't really get the same volume fraction as you have if you have non-resonant excitation. Does anyone take that into account, or is do we just neglect for that? I'm not sure if, you, if I understand the question. The penetration, the volume actually that is responding from your yeah. sample to your tip backwards and to your detector is always the, that yeah. quantity that we are going to analyze. Mm -hmm. Now, that changes as a function of wavelengths and whether or the, not the there's probing resonance. volume below the tip. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it changes also for the modulation orders. How? How do you mean in demodulation in the amplitude? Uh, if, if you go to a higher demodulation order, you probe uh, less. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yes. But, um, okay. 
when we do a spectrum, we don't think of actually that this is changing, right? Let's, uh, say, let's take the third order. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I know. I think I don't know. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. Um, b because the, 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 the penetration depth of the near field uh, depends on the, yeah, the momentum of this near field. This could be frequency dependent, but it's dominated by the tip radius. So uh, the same way that we have the same spatial resolution uh, in the terahertz and the infrared. And the same way, uh, the probing volume should be the same. No, no, stay with the third harmonic, yeah. and, but change the frequency. Okay, I agree that actually the volume, so to say, under the tip is the same, right? Yeah, and the tip. But I, I'm not agreeing that actually the volume that is responding is the same. Uh, it is. <laughs> I think it is. Yeah, because it's, it's uh, limited by the tip radius in this case. So the moment, momentum by the tip radius is huge, and the, the momentum by the wave, it's relatively small compared to that. And if you change the small part, by changing the wavelength, if I understood correctly. Yeah, we can discuss it all. Laterally, okay, but into the depth, no. It's an enhancement effect. It's an enhancement absorption enhancement that goes in parallel. That's something not intuitive. When we started, it was a surprise. Mm -hmm. I think if we sit down with a piece of paper and uh, okay. I, I'm also not 100% sure. Yeah. yeah, also because it's surprising you see a far field effect by reflection and you don't see that. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, if not, let's uh, thank Lars again. Lars is done for the day, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>